Hi everybody, Kat Jackson here with the Hobby Hangout, bringing you another fun tutorial today. And this time we're joined with Caleb Wissenbach of CK Studios. He'll be sharing some tips and tricks on weathering and working to make wood. And we'll probably be spending about an hour doing this. It's an interactive experience. If you have any questions after this video, be sure to reach out to us. You can catch us on CK Studios or at the Hobby Hangout Facebook page. I'm handing it over to you now, Caleb. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Caleb with CK Studios. And uh, today, we're going to talk about wood and weathering. Um, I'm right in the process of uh, finishing up a piece that's going to go to Clash for the Cure. Uh, so I thought this would be a really great opportunity to actually see some of the techniques that I use, um, even for a display piece. Uh, you can definitely use this in your regular army building or uh, for simple uh, simple pieces. But um, I just kind of want to go through and show you guys some of the techniques. The first thing I'm going to do is show you guys the different materials that we can use to create wood. I'll be kind of quick on this. How to kind of make some of the stuff look pretty good, a little more to scale for our models. Um, a lot of times when we're collecting stuff, it won't be very to scale. So I'll show you how to do that. And then we'll kind of talk about how to weather it, make it look grungy, make it look uh, a little more realistic, make sure that light's capturing properly and yet still keep composition, stuff like that. So we'll go into a little bit of all of that. We'll talk a little bit about composition and design and why certain things are the way they are uh, that I have on the piece. So we'll kind of jump through a few things. Probably takes about an hour. Uh, feel free to stop me if you guys have any questions. Um, if I didn't explain something real well or whatever, uh, just go ahead. But without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into it. So I'm going to switch over to the workstation camera. So, so to start off, I want to kind of talk about a couple of different materials that we use. So here's here's the piece that, that we're doing today. I've already airbrushed it, kind of prepped some of the colors and everything. Um, this is going to be the display that the model sits on. You guys get a little sneak preview real quick of, of Braylene and stuff. And she's coming out of the piece. Um, yeah, I guess you can kind of see it like that. So you can see the, the composition and the texture of everything. So we're going to work on creating more scale. So what I built this out of is just simple popsicle sticks. Um, and then I did, uh, I built some saloon doors that should be coming out of, and I built that out of plastic art. Uh, so you see I'm using a couple of different materials. The bricks, of course, I sculpted with milliput. Um, the, br the bricks right here are all sculpted with milliput. But the rest of this is all pretty much, um, well, it is all uh, popsicle sticks, and then I just use some of that that core, whatever, plastic. That's the basis for the wall. Um, so uh, the first thing I do when I want to put my my popsicle sticks is I'm just going to come in and, and I'll square them up. We want to get rid of a little round end because those are really noticeable as being popsicle sticks, right? Um, so I kind of want to get rid of that. So I'll kind of, I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll cut my, my pieces. I'll figure out my design and stuff like that. Once I have the pieces in place, I'm going to use a wire brush like this, and I'm just going to gently run it along the popsicle stick. You don't have to be real clean, but what happens when I do this, and you really see it when I put a wash on this, is it's going to create a little more texture. Because the popsicle stick itself is really smooth. If you run your finger along, it, you'll feel that it's really smooth. But then once I get in here with the wire brush, um, I, I start to create a little bit of, uh, that's really drowning out with the light, isn't it? Anyways, it, it'll create a little bit of texture. Here, I'll show you, I'll show you how you can see that texture. Um, I'll throw a little wash on it a little fast. Huh? So here's a regular popsicle stick. If I just wash it, you can see a little texture comes up. But, but not a lot of texture is showing. A little bit darker so you can see. Um, the, the popsicle stick is really smooth. But now on this side where I ran the, the wire brush, you can see there, there's a lot more texture 
a lot more feel to it. We're going to really play with that um, to create that wood look. So first thing I'll do is I'll take that wire brush to distress it. Um, then I need to kind of make it look a little more realistic. We're going to put some knot holes in it real quick. And what I'll do with the knot holes, I'm just going to take my X-Acto knife and I'll just carve little arcs. You know, you get a knot. Um, So, you know, if I have that, that piece of wood, I'm just going to take and I'm going to carve. I'm just going to carve these shapes into it. And I'll come in and I'll put another one in here, and then I'll just do that. So it creates a, a little knot. Um, so here I'm carving it. Now we can do two things. We can either create the center of the knot. I'll kind of take the exacto knife, and I'll just dig in just a little bit, and I'll leave the knot in place. So the knot would look something like something like that. Or I can come in with a drill bit. And I don't want to go straight. I don't want to go straight down directly down with the with the knot. I want to go at just a little bit of an angle. The reason is it'll just create a little more interest. And I'll just drill through it so you can see it went at a nice angle like that. I'll drill through it. You don't really want the the wood wet. It's a little wet right now because of the because of the wash I put on it. But I, I just simply put a hole in the center. And then I'll take my exacto knife. We don't want a perfectly round hole because no knot is like exactly perfectly round. So I'll come in and I'll just kind of chew it up just a little bit with the exacto knife. But now to create a nice knot. So, so it gives more interest to the wood. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, I'll come in and, and maybe I'll come along the end and I'll split it just a little bit like this. And a lot of times you'll notice like uh, the planking, the trim around a door or a window will split at the ends as, as it dries and the heat gets it and stuff will get these splits. So I might just do that with the wood too. And I just took the exact knife and kind of just split it. Don't worry about it breaking too much. I mean, if it gets too rough like that, that's kind of, you know, it, once you put the glue to it, it'll still look cool, but you can kind of leave a little bit of looseness to it. It just creates more interest. Now, another thing that will happen with wood is when it gets walked on, you'll notice that it'll get worn down and you'll get this chip. So like in this threshold here, I wouldn't want a real square edge. I want that to be kind of worn down and chipped. Or along these edges here, we're going to get a lot of wear and tear, right, as, as people are going in and out of the building and stuff. So I'm going to create that wear and tear. I'll just do the same thing. I'll take my exacto knife, and I'm going to kind of run it along the side. And I want the catch in places so it's nice and uneven. I'll kind of, kind of chip it up and stuff. Be careful right here so you don't cut yourself. But I can just come in and distress the side of the wood. I mean, all this stuff is super fast, and it'll start to create more of a, a plain look instead of a popsicle look. Um, you can do the same thing with balsa wood. It's going to be a lot softer. When you do the brush with the balsa wood, be a little more gentle on it. With this, I was kind of firm and hard because the popsicle stick will allow you to really get a lot of texture. If you're going to do it with balsa wood, just be a little more gentle. Um, but that will create that, that nice, warm look. One thing we want to be aware of is where, you know, when we talk about it, with chipping, with anything, you have to understand where traffic would be. And the traffic would be in the middle of this piece of wood. It wouldn't really be up on the edge. So you'll notice on the edges, I left the edge nice and square right here um, because there'd be a lot less traffic there. But right in this middle, I let it really wear down. We want to really show that, that motion uh, of people walking in and out. Uh, the other thing that we can build wood with is plastic cards. So these doors are made out of plastic. Oops. These doors are made out of plastic card. Um, you can kind of tell they look a little more plasticky. They don't look quite as nice as as the popsicle stick does. A popsicle stick definitely gives you a lot more dimension. The plastic card is easier to build with and shape. Uh, and that's why I, I decided to go with a piece of plastic card for the doors. It'd be really hard to create this with wood. It'd be a, at least for me. Okay. I'm sure there's other people that are very talented that, that could sculpt it pretty well. Um, I just use plastic card to build it. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just get our piece of plastic card. And instead of using the wire brush to create that 
the shape of the wood. I'm just going to take a razor knife. I don't want my razor knife to be super sharp. I want it to be just slightly dull. Uh, the reason is, is I want to really etch and gouge the wood, not necessarily cut it real sharp. If I cut it real sharp, um, you know, all it's going to do is cut these really super fine lines into it and look like an X-Acto knife. It will kind of start to peel the plastic up. But if the X-Acto knife is slightly dull, it'll, it'll create just a little bit more of a shape. And I'm not going to be real straight with it. I want to have kind of a flow. So just, you know, if you need to, grab a piece of wood and take a look at it or whatever. But I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to kind of do little wavy motions to, to create the shape in it. Uh, if I want to do a, a knot, I'll do the same thing. I'll kind of kind of cut those arcs, and then I'll make them just a little tighter, with little a few more arcs, and then chisel the middle out. And I'll just come in and I'll cut this. Now the next step, once that I've cut this, is I'm going to take a little bit of sandpaper. And where did I put a piece of sandpaper? I'm, I'm redoing my desk, so it's just a little messed up. So I'm going to take kind of a fine grit sandpaper. Sandpaper, I don't want it too rough. And I'm going to take and I'm just going to lightly run it across the wood. Um, what happens here is it, it just starts to knock down and put just a little bit of variation. It also takes the shine off of the plastic part. If you have too much shine on the plastic card, it's going to look like plastic. But if you can just put just a slight matte finish to it, I like to do that after I cut in all of the little shapes, um, all the little grooves and stuff into the wood because um, it helps to knock down those edges that the exacto knife is going to make anyways. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. And then I can do the exact same thing. If I want to weather the sides, I can come in and do little chips. I can run the brush along it. You know. Little variations will really go a long way in creating wood. Even though the boards that you buy at Home Depot are going to always be nice and square and nice and straight, if you can create just a little variation, let, let your plastic card wave just a little bit and stuff like that. It looks more natural. It looks less synthetic. Um, so kind of keep those things in mind. That's kind of how I, I would build stuff. So, um, Is there any questions on that or anything that you guys want to know and as far as building? No? Okay. Well, um, the next thing I'll do is, is we'll go into to painting and airbrushing. Um, I like to airbrush when I get into wood. I'm going to prime it black. The reason I like to airbrush is that all of your recesses are always going to stay a little black. If I come in and start to brush this with a hand brush, um, my recesses, the paint's going to go into the recesses because the little fingers of the brush, the little bristles, are going to go in and kind of hit all those recesses. But with the airbrush, I can kind of keep some of that darkness in there. It, it really helps create the shape. It also helps to find the cracks because the airbrush will kind of just hit the surface. All that black that we sprayed, um, you know, when I primed it, you can see here it's primed black, but then up here um, I've airbrushed it in. Determining colors. Determining colors is really tough when you come into wood. There's so many pictures out there. Um, a lot of it is based on what type of wood, what the design is going to be, and stuff like that. For this piece, I wanted to go with, with more of a, of a ghost town, uh, Midwest piece. But I also, my figure is very red in her browns. She's got a lot of reds in there. I want the figure to stand out. If I were to go with a lot of red browns like I did in the back here, she wouldn't stand out as much. You notice if I put the model next to, next to everything in the back, she doesn't stand out as much. But in the front, she really stands out. I want a lot of muted almost a grayish brown of I, I use the the uh, miniature paints for this and I picked out a couple of colors that I really like um, if you get a chance take a look at this one of them is earth which is a nice um, neutral brown it, it doesn't have a lot of red into it but it still reads as brown but it, and it also doesn't have a lot of yellows um, so this was a nice neutral this was my base color and then my highlight color I went with rotten wood um, so, I mean, that was kind of self-explanatory, but I really like this color because it's super desaturated. They, they took a, a nice brown and they added pure white to it, and that helps desaturate. As the sun baked stuff, it's going to be really, really desaturate. If you go out and start to look at really old wood, it's almost gray. Um, gray wouldn't 
quite fit for what I was doing. So I went with this nice, really desaturated brown, and we're going to carry this over when we start to do our detailing. You're going to notice my colors will run very desaturated on the outside of the building, whereas on the inside, um, they'll be more vibrant. They'll have a lot more color saturation in them because it, it would be inside of the building. So we're not going to get the, the desaturation, the sun fade um, that we would see on the outside. So these are the colors that I use for the outside. For the inside, I just use cracked leather. Um, it's a little more of a red base brown, but still a nice basis color that I used. And then I airbrushed in a little more of this bark color. And you notice here, this is really orange. Uh, this has got a lot of orange red to it, which is really nice. And then for my shadows, um, I shot in a Dalaroni uh, burnt umber. This has got a very yellow look to it. But as it coats and it gets deeper and deeper, it, it, all, it almost takes on almost a black. Um, it's really neat how, how the inks work. So uh, the very back of this, you'll see the inks right back in here and how it's a very desaturated, almost black color. Um, so those are the colors that I airbrushed in. I, airbrush, I went ahead and airbrushed first because it takes forever for this stuff to, to dry. So now I want to go in and do my detailing. And I've kind of put in a couple of of uh, knot holes and stuff. Here's one that, that's unfinished. It's the other one that's finished. I went ahead and, and left one unfinished so you can see how we're going to prep it. Um, so I'm going to go in now and I'm going to take some of that wash and I'm going to use uh, right here this Army Painter Strong Tone. Uh, this is the color that I, I really like to use when I'm doing a lot of washes. It's, it's a very dark brown but it's not black. It still stays brown. And it does have a slight yellow base to it as it breaks down, which is really nice. So I'm just going to go in, and I'm going to wash in that knot. I want to be just a little heavy as I put the, the, the inks into this knot, because normally when we see a knot in wood, the knot is usually a little more discolored, a little darker than the area around it. It's got a little more of the, of the what are those called, the phy phylum, which are the... the the cells that transfer, that transfer the, uh, oh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, the stuff that does the photosynthesis. Uh, <clears throat> a knot will have a lot of that around it. So as that wood dies and dries, it's going to be a lot darker. You know? It's just like the, the cat, cat, cadmium layer that's around the outside of the tree right before it hits the bark. So we kind of want to put some of that darkness in to define the knots. So I'm just going to go in. And I'll do just a couple coats to kind of define that knot. Um, I don't need can to be real clean. <clears throat> yes, go can, ahead. I, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. There's uh, for the people that don't actually um, use airbrushes a lot. What what are some of the ideas that you could give over to replacing what you've done with airbrush? Okay. Um, if you don't have an airbrush, there's a couple of ways that we'll, we'll go about painting this. We can almost do the same thing, and you'll see a little bit of it more when I start to do some of the detailing. Mm -hmm. What I would do if I didn't have an airbrush is I'd come in and I would base coat, and I would try to base coat with a nice dark color. I know that, I know that kind of works a little bit backwards, but if you go in with a really nice dark color, it's going to settle into all of the recesses, all the little joints. You need to make sure your paint's not really thick. If you paint in a really thick paint, it's going to, to fill in all, all the, the texture that we created with that brush. If we put a really super heavy paint on, it's going to fill in all that texture. So instead of doing that, I want to be really light with it. I'm going to put on a couple of really light coats, just like if you're base coating a model. I want to be real careful not to be real heavy handed. That sucks if it's a big piece. If the big piece mm -hmm. is going to take you a little while to, to fill, but that's okay. Um, once you've got a nice base coat on it, you're going to go in and do a full, a full old school GW style wash. Get get a a dark a dark wash. The strong skin tone would be really good, or Delvin mud or something like that. And just go over and wash the entire thing. It's going to settle into all the recesses, all the cracks. It's going to darken those up even more than the color that you get. So say I was going to to do a piece of wood, I would base coat with this color here with my crack leather. It's a lot whoops, it's a lot darker than the base coat that I used originally. Um, I would base coat with this color, and then I'm going to go up. Once everything's dried, I'm going to come in and I'm just going to dry brush. I know that's like the, the bad word, dry brush, but I would that's how I would go about um, creating the, the surface on your 
on your models. Uh, hopefully, Kat can link the picture to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Death Corps Creed guy I did. Um, sure. All of that wood was done pre-airbrush. I didn't have an airbrush back then. That's how I went about doing it. That was done with balsa wood. Um, I still use the brush to create the, the contours, the, the grooving, and the texture of the wood. Then I came in and I, uh, I placed all the... Uh, uh, I, I, I did the base coats and then I washed everything with a really dark wash. And then I came back in and I just started to go with my brighter colors and I just slowly did little dry brushes. Um, when you're dry brushing, don't go with the grain, go across the grain. So here, this model, the grain is going this way. So I would come in and I would dry brush this way. That way it picks up all the grain, picks up all the nuances, and that wash will stay down in into the, to the recesses. It'll, it'll create a lot more shape, a lot more detail for you. Um, so I hope that kind of answers you, that question. So you should at this point, even if you're brushing, you should be almost at the point that we're at right now with this. So here you can see we've kind of got our details. One last thing that I did is I came in with a nice point. Uh, use this. A thumb, oh, there it is. A thumb tack will work or whatever. And what I want to do is I want to put in my nail holes, um, you know, when they put in nails and stuff. So all I did is I just went and just gently punched. So here I'll kind of do it on the back side. So we want to make sure that our line is nice and smooth. So I'm just going to take a nice straight piece. And I want to create the lines that, that would be created from when they went and nailed the floor in. So I'm just going to take this. And I'm just going to gently press two holes for each board. Usually they, they'll, they'll put two in. If, if they don't have two nails in a board, the board will start to cut after a while. So they always put two, two nail holes in. Usually they're about an inch, inch and a half from the edge. Um, on really big sheets, they might do three holes. Um, but I think that would be too distracting from the piece. So I went ahead and I just put in those, those couple of holes. I'm going to do the same thing now. I'm going to come in with my wash. wash brush over here. Uh, I'm going to come back in with that dark wash. And I'm just going to gently put a wash along those nail holes. Because we want those to really define. And we're going to come back and define them even more in a little bit. But for right now, I'll just put a gentle wash in. Um, so you can just kind of barely see those, those spots here. Go ahead and spot them in just a little bit better. Now in the front, I went with a very light color. So I don't want to add too much wash to them. Because I don't want like this strip line of, of wash in there. So I'm just going to kind of gently feed the wash in there and clear it just a little bit. That way, now you can see those, all those little, little nail holes are just a little, little more well-defined. Now you can really kind of now you can really start to see those nail holes that I that I placed in the piece. And I have a little bit of tidying over them. Once I've let the the wash kind of soak in and and it's pretty close to dry, it's going to come in and just kind of quickly. I won't get rid of too much of the tidying, and that's okay because we're going to use that to our favor here in a minute. But I'll get rid of just a little bit of it. I just softened it just a little bit. So my next, te my next thing I'm going to do is I need to come back in and define. So we're going to do some dry brushing now. Um, I have one of the older GW colors. It's a nice desaturated um, brown. I really like this Denab Stone. Um, it's an old GW color. Um, I really like this because it's got just such a, such a nice pale look to it. I like that color, and then I'm just going to use the standard uh, bone color from GW. Um, the reason I'm picking two colors is I want to vary 
the dry brushing around the model so that it, it's not all just one tone. If it's all one tone, it, it'll become very boring. But if we can if we can make just a little bit of variation, and the colors aren't that far apart, but we'll notice it with our eyes. So I'm going to get a nice, good dry brush. Um, if you haven't dry brushed before, it's really simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my paint. I'm going to load it on the brush like this. And then I'm just going to take a paper towel and I'll wipe it off until the majority of the paint is done. I like to kind of put it on my hand. And if it starts to define the creases in your hand like this, we know that, that, that our dry brush is working well. It took a little bit too much paint off of that, so I'm going to add just a, a little bit more. So you can see, I'm starting to really define the, the handprint. Um, so I know that that's pretty good. That's a good way to test it. I'm going to start at the outside edge. And I really want to create as much wear and tear on this as I can. So I'm going to be pretty heavy in here. Again, I'm going against the grain. I'm not going with the grain. If I go with the grain, the brush could go into the recesses. And I don't want that. I want to make sure that I keep the definition as much as possible. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go right over where those nails were. This is where the wood is going to have the least flex. Um, as people are walking over a walkway, the floor is going to flex. If you have a wood floor, you'll hear it creak and stuff like that. But along these boards, we're going to have the least amount of flex. So this will have the heaviest scuff marks as the cowboys and stuff are walking along with their boots. We're going to have the, we're going to have the heaviest concentration of scuff marks right along where that line is. Oops, where that line is because the, the floor is not uh, flexing as much there. So I'm going to come in with that other color now. And I just want to create just a little bit of variation. Again, I'm going against the grain. I'm just kind of defining the floor shape just a little bit. It's going to help kind of define that. I'm going to go with just a little bit brighter. Grab some more of that Denab stone. Now, I'm going to concentrate just a little bit more right in this area because this is the entrance to the walkway. So we're going to also have a lot of scuff marks there because that's where everybody's walking. We wouldn't really want too much scuff marks over, over here because people aren't going to get up against that. We're going to actually go in and put some washes in here to really darken that up um, to show that you know grime and stuff's going to collect in there. If you're doing a piece and you want to add leaves and dirt and stuff like that, that's a really good place to add that um, because there's not going to be a lot of traffic and that's where the wind's going to kind of sweep in and add to it and stuff. So here I'm kind of feathering this around. I'm really defining the boards right in front of that walkway. Also along this threshold right here. This threshold's going to catch a lot of traffic. So we want that to be nice and bright. I also want the scuff marks to kind of go in the direction of where people would walk. So I want that threshold. You'll notice now, right here, you can see there's a lot more definition going on right in here, which is going to be good too, because that's where the character is going to be standing. So the more definition we can put around the character, the more we can point towards the character. Um, so I'll go in and I'll do the exact same thing. I'm going to come in and I'm going to detail up all these boards up here. Right along this very top edge here, we might even add just a little bit of pure white. That's going to where the sun is going to hit the hardest. Um, and, and without a lot of grime and foot traffic and stuff like that, you're not going to see a lot of dirt. So you're going to, you're going to, see just a pretty good sun fade right along the very top of this. So I'd want to come in, come in here. Now, because this piece, you're considering the idea that you're flowing up more above this, there's more to this building than this, just this facade. We want to make sure that we don't highlight that top edge. If we highlight that top edge, it's going to show that, that it stops. Instead, we're actually going to go in and we're going to put just a little bit more shadow in up there to really create that idea of definition. The other thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I get this edge right along the bricks because I want a really nice 
delineation of the bricks and the wood. It's going to create more shape. If you ever sat through one of uh, Roman Lacotte's basing classes, he talks about he talks about weight. And when you're building a model, things need to be heavy, things need to be light, stuff like that. And it goes by size and how how the mind perceives things. Bricks are really heavy. Wood's going to be light. So if I can put a really nice light edge along that wood. Can you hear me, Caleb? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if this just happened for everybody, but you said rum in the pot and something, and then it faded out for me. Did that happen for everybody? Are you there? No, I heard everything. Okay. No, so I nice. heard too. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Just Never in mind. case it did, if, if maybe it did it for the, since you're recording for the YouTube, if it did fade out from that, um, I was talking about Roman Lapot and his basing class. In his basing classes, he talks about weight and how um, when you build a model, there needs to be weight. You need to have, have you need to have really heavy aspects and really light aspects. And it's not necessarily the material that you're building with, but it's how the mind perceives it. Brick is going to be very heavy. Your mind perceives it as brick. As brick is heavy, whereas wood is light, so it's going to be perceived as light. Um, if I put a really nice light edge along the wood, right where it meets the brick, it's going to reinforce that idea of depth and lightness. So if you look at this piece right now, you'll notice right now the brick does look a lot heavier than the wood because of that that nice edge. The wood looks very sun dried. It, it looks like you know there's not a lot of water in it. When wood is dry, it's really it's really light. So you know we want to create that edge. So we're going to come in and kind of do that. So I've, I've kind of created the detail and stuff, and, and I, I've created the shape and everything. So now we're going to put the wear in. I kind of talked about it, um, the washes that we're going to do. So again, we're going to come back with with some more of that strong tone. I'm also going to add a little bit of this uh, umber, this uh, Dalaroni umber. Um, and both these colors really work well together. And I'm going to come in, and I'm just going to do some light washes. And I'm, only, I'm going to wash right in towards the joint. And I want to make sure that I that I don't get tidying. So once I put the wash in, I'm going to come back with clear water, and I'm just going to wash that edge. So this is almost like blending. Imagine that we're blending with a wash. Um, I'm not going to be real, real smooth with it, though, because as grime and dirt and everything builds up, we want it to be bumpy. We want it to have texture to it um, along this this edge, as all those boots walk in here, they're going to deposit a little bit of mud that's going to get trapped right in that joint where the threshold and, and the, the, the walkway meet. So we want to make that nice and dark too, and maybe, maybe right into this corner here. So I'll come in with the umber now. Now you can see the umber is really heavy. Um, the the, the whatever it is, if it's in the pigment, sorry, um, that are in the Dalaronis are really, really dominant heavy. So we want to be real gentle with those and we do it. Um, might come back in and just re-dry brush this block right there just a little bit because I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose that nice wear. But then when I come back into these edges and corners and stuff, I want to make sure that these are really heavy. And then I want to just kind of smooth out that wash. Don't let it don't let it tie pull on you. So now we're starting to get a lot more shape. You kind of start to see a little more definition, a little more movement to the piece. Um, the more we can create these vectors that point towards the model, so Here's a vector that's going this way, and then on this side, I'm going to create a vector that goes this way. It'll help focus towards the model. So I'll kind of exaggerate the shadow over here because I really want the interest in the model. Is there a, a, an equivalent other type of ink that might be in if we're we're not using the Dollarani Dollarani? Is um, there, can you Liquitex, suggest something different? Liquitex is a good is a good ink to use also. Um, there, I, I like Dalaroni better, but I 
it's mainly for the airbrushing aspects of Dalaroni. Mm -hmm. And I use them, but Liquitex makes a nice one too. Either Dalaroni <coughs> or Liquitex you can pick up at Michael's, at Hobby Lobby. At, um, oh, what's that East Coast one called? AC Moore. AC Moore, thank you. Um, any of those places should should have these inks in here. So we want to make sure these inks dry out pretty well before we do too much more. Um, and, and just kind of play with them if you want to come in and add more or less. You know, it's it's all a balancing act. We'll we'll kind of just go back and forth, back and forth with it. I know right here I'd like to have just the, the very front of this a touch lighter. So I'm gonna come back in with my drag brush. And I'm gonna take just a little bit more of that to map stone. And I'm gonna really concentrate on just this edge right here. Because this is gonna really focus towards the model. Now I am kind of dry brushing but the paint's a touch thick. Um, it's just going to add just a little bit. And I'm using the, the bristles to kind of create just a little bit more texture than was there before. And then I'll come in and smooth it out with a quick, a quick dry brush right along the top. Reestablish my dry brush here. Reestablish it right in there. So. I'm pretty happy with that right here. Starting to get a nice texture to it. You can kind of see the, the motion and movement. So now I'm going to just kind of let that sit and dry. I want to make sure that all of my, my, my washes and inks are dry. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, once I'm at the point where I've kind of created the texture that I want for the wood, and I'm really happy with that, I'm going to come in and I, I want to define all of these little nail marks and stuff now. So I'm just going to get a fine brush, something a little more detailed like this. I'm going to get some orange paint. I don't want it to be super bright orange. So I'm using kind of a, of a subdued orange. This is, the, this is the orange for the brass set from uh, Reaper Bones. This is the brass non-metallic metals. Um, I really like this orange color. It's a very subdued orange. You can see it right here on my palette. Uh, this is the color right here. Uh, I like it. It's a very nice subdued orange. So I'm going to kind of make a wash out of this. And then I'm just going to come in and I'm just going to do very light little pinpoint washes right on those nail points. You want to make sure that the paint is wet enough that it's going to go into the recess more than outside of it. And this will just be the idea that the, that the nail head is rusting. So here I've kind of defined those nail heads a little bit more. Now if it was on the sides of boards, like here, when I come in and I, I put that dot in, I want to make it run because we're going to get just a little bit of, you know, as, as the rust comes out, it's going to kind of kind of run off of the nails. And don't worry if you're too heavy-handed with it because we're, we're going to come back in and do just a little bit of final cleanup um, with another dry brush. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot of dry brushing in this technique. Um, it's kind of fun, you know, to, to go back to, to doing some of the techniques that, that everybody kind of tells you to get away from. Um, I, I will dry brush my metallics a lot. Like when I do this, when I do this, this drain pipe, uh, you'll end up seeing a lot of, of uh, dry brushing in that, too. So here I'm just. I'm hey, hey, Caleb. Hey, yes, Caleb. I have a question about that pipe. Oh, I'm sorry about that background noise. If there's any. Um, oh, you're all right. Have you Have you thought about using, or would you use a pigment instead of just paint and dry brush? Yes, I'm gonna use pigment too. Uh, I I'll, I'll do a mix of all of that stuff. Um, once I put the pigment in and really refine everything, I'll come back in and 
I'm going to dry brush. And when I dry brush, I'm going to actually dry brush a line right down the middle right here. With the pigment, it'll be really hard to keep a really defined, smooth line. But with a dry brush, I'll be able to. So it'll still have the texture because of the pigments. But as I dry brush right over the top, it'll create that, that focus of light. Um, it's kind of cheating a little bit, but in, in realism, it probably wouldn't be there. But as a composition-wide, composition I want to see that. Um, so now that I've got all of my little rust pieces in, I'm going to come back in and again with that dry brush. Oops, wrong brush. I'm going to take that dry brush again. And I'm going to dry brush the top of those nail holes again because the rust, the rust would start to, to fade and, and, and absorb into the wood. So now, with just a little bit of dry brush, it redefined the nail holes, but it gave the idea. See, it gives just the, the little bit of the idea of the rust streaking, but the rust isn't super dominant, you know. Um, on metal or something, you would really make that rust dominant because it's going to constantly renew itself. But on wood, it really wouldn't renew itself. It would kind of absorb into the wood as, as it's created. You know, it, This is a desert western area. You know, It's going to be pretty arid, so we wouldn't really see a lot of... of I mean, there would be rust, but there's not going to be a lot of heavy streaking. Everything's going to rust. It's going to oxidize pretty good. But it's not going to be super streaky rust like you would see like on the East Coast. <coughs> um, so now I'm at the point where I've kind of defined everything. I've got the colors that I want in there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start adding some pigment powders to it. Um, the ones I chose is Dark Earth. Be gentle with these pigment powders, man. They make a mess. and I am, I am horrible with them. I, I create massive amounts of mess. Uh, then I, I grab burning sand. Burning sand is going to be kind of my dust. Um, you know, as as since we're in a, a, a prairie town or wherever, uh, we're going to get some dust build up. I also like this yellow, uh, this dark yellow. Um, it's just going to give a nice variation. If everything's too desaturated, everything will become a little boring. But if I can put just a little bit of, of a brighter color in, uh, especially with the pigments, it would just create that idea of just a little more movement. So I'm going to take the, the, my dark pigment first, and I'm going to gently, so that I don't make a mess, I'm just going to grab a little bit on the end of my brush like this, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to set it in where I was creating all those shadows. This is going to help to, to create a, a little more texture, a little more defined. Maybe kind of rub it into some of the, the nail holes. Here and just in the recesses, there you go. Here, right in these recesses, I want to. I'm going to put some light in there because this is where, you know, the grime really wouldn't get cleared away by people walking. So I'm just going to mainly kind of put this stuff where grime would collect in there. Really, just a little bit on these nail holes. And then I'll come back in, just put in a little too much. I don't really want that much. So I'll probably come back in and do just another another dry brush over the end of that. Just to, I, I don't really like that too much there. Going right along the top edge of this, we're going to get a little bit of dirt that's going to kind of collect in the edges here. I'm going to tap it off. It helps to kind of clear any, any 
for the pigments that you really didn't want to lose or something. I'm going to come back in with my burning sands. This is, gonna, this is my lighter stuff. This is really going to give a dusty look. So before, I was, I was really packing that stuff into the corners with this. With this, I'm going to load my brush. I'm going to kind of clear just a little bit of on the paper. I'm going to put just a light dusting of this stuff. I'm kind of almost like a dry brush again. But this is going to give that idea of, of the. Oops. Um, this just gives that idea of, of you know, where, where dust is going to collect. And this would be the really light, fine dust. The dark dust would be more of the, the heavy, dark dirts. Whereas this this burning sand would be that that really light coating that you get, like if if you were out in a windstorm and you left your windows down in your truck, you come back in and your dash has got that really light light smattering of dust on it. That's what this is going to be. Um, so we want to make sure that we put this on the surfaces that would collect on, on the the tops of surfaces. We really wouldn't want it too much on the vertical faces. So so like here we wouldn't we really wouldn't want it down here on, on, on the sides here. We want it along the top of here. You know, all those those areas that dust is going to collect. Um, the, the hard to reach areas that... Is there a substitute to use if you don't have um, the pigments? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, you can go in and try to, try to do some dry brushing and stuff like that, but you just don't get you just don't get the, the look and the feel of dust. And that's the secret weapons weathering product you're using. Yeah, I'm using the secret weapons. You can see like right there along the top of the, the board and stuff. I, I, a little heavy. You might, I might want to get rid of a little bit of that. One thing you can do if you're too heavy and you kind of don't like it is just get your brush wet. Just kind of pick up just a little bit of it. It's not going to pick it all up, but it will pick up a little bit. So you can kind of come in and if, you're, if you feel that you're too heavy, you can pick up just a little bit of it by using water. Okay, so once I'm 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 kind of happy. Oh, I gotta put in some of this yellow. I just want to use this to, to create just a little bit of color. Um, if you do end up cleaning up some with a brush, don't use that same brush and go into your next pigment. Grab a new dry brush. You don't really want to use a wet brush for this part of the technique. If you're creating mud and stuff like that, then you're, you're fine to go in with a wet brush because it's going to clump and it'll make some really neat, interesting mud. Um, but here I don't really want that. I'm, I'm going for more of the dust effect. And I'm being a lot more sparing with this yellow because it, it'll get really dominant really fast. Everything else is so desaturated that this, this, this yellow will will get will create color really quick. So I'll be kind of careful of that. Uh, so there we go. I mean um, you can start to see now I've got it's it's pretty well weathered, you know it's, it's looking like a like a nice old old building. Um, so the next thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do with this is I want to take some pigment fixer now. What I'll do in this, because I did so much testing, is I'm going to actually put the pigment fixer in my airbrush and lightly shoot it. Um, this will just help to, to, to set all the pigment. If you don't have an airbrush and you want to do this, what you can do is take a, a really light brush, something that's kind of big and light like this. You're going to take the, you're going to take the pigment fixer. And I'm going to load the brush with that pigment fixer. 
and I'm going to come up just at the very edge of where my pigment is and just lightly touch. And you can see the pigment fixer running along it. So I'm just going to kind of come in and just lightly touch where all those pigments are. The reason we want to lightly touch is if we're heavy, we'll, we'll actually pick the pigment up with the brush. We don't want to do that. We want it to, to stick. So just kind of come in and let the capillary action do its thing. Uh, on the wood, it, it works really well because the wood, even though you have paint on it, the wood still kind of wants to run just a little bit. So. We'll kind of do that. We'll let this dry. Um, whatever you do, if you're a brush licker, don't lick this stuff. It is, oh, it's so bad. I've done it a couple times. I always forget, and I go in and, and get a whole mouthful of stuff. I'm sure it's poisonous. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure it says, uh, if swallowed, do not induce vomiting. Call a physician or poison center immediately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, try, try not to... Uh, Try, try not to, to lick your brush on that stuff. So now that we're done, we're going to let that dry. The pigment fixer will actually dry relatively quick. Um, it doesn't take that long. I have a fan going in the background, so it, it's going to dry pretty quick. Now I'm going to fix that area that I kind of messed up. I, I accidentally put just a little bit too much of that pigment right there in that walkway. So again, I'm just going to come back with my, with my dry brush color. Just come over and dry brush over the top of it. So that pigment fixer allowed that pigment to fix right down. And now it's almost like a paint. So where I can come back in and just do any kind of cleanup that I, I, that I need to do with the brush. I can still do that right over the pigment and not have to worry about the pigment coming off. All right. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty much the basics of it. Uh, you saw a lot of airbrushing. It's really simple stuff. It was nothing super difficult, nothing really hard. Uh, the last thing I suggest is, before you forget, make sure that you take your pigment, fold it up nice and neat, and try to get that out of your work area as quick as possible, because it will get on everything if you don't. Um, so now I'm at the point where, you know, I'm just going to kind of compare my colors and, and see, see how my, how my, my composition looks and, and where I'm going. I'm pretty happy with that. I, I think that it's a nice pale. It, it's got good shape to it, but it's not really going to detract from the model. The model is really presented on it. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, that's it. I mean, that's, that's how I go about doing my weathering of wood. That was awesome. Can we send um, you questions afterwards? Yes. Is there any way to get um, a list of like the different um, products that you used for this? Yeah, I can do that. I can post up uh, some of the different products that I used and where you can find them and stuff. Uh, yeah. To clarify too, so you guys know, and in the future if you're building something like this. I'm going to fill all of these. Um, I had them filled and then went and did the work. Some of it broke and fell down. But I will fill all this. I want, I don't want any of this to be, to, to be able to be seen. You know, I want this to be all smooth along with the sides and everything. They'll be really smooth to give the idea of more shape. If you ever have broken pieces that are part of the piece, um, it won't help with, with creating movement and shape. The other thing I'm going to do is, is on this piece, I'm going to add this, this little box right here. And it's, it's just going to create a little more movement and shape. You know, we talked about those weights and having heavy stuff and light stuff. You kind of see the, the reason for the pole now is, is the, pole creates, the pole creates a little more definition and shape here. It also creates more movement. And it, it gives you depth of the piece because the, the drain of the pipe is right here. 
And then the crates right here, now the crates I'll leave hanging slightly off of the piece. What happens with those crates hanging off the side is, as you can see, well, with my finger there doesn't help, but it, it creates the idea that the piece continues out past the very edges of, of, my, of my display. So that's pretty much composition. Um, pretty simple things to do, but um, yeah, that's weathering work. Fantastic. That was awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. No questions? I have one. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so with the whole, with the whole piece, piece together. together. I'm loud, I'm loud. <coughs> I'm sorry, with sorry, the whole piece together, is there a backdrop that goes with it? Uh, I'm sorry. So, uh, so um, it, 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 she's coming out, coming of, the, out of the uh, uh, doors. doors. Will well, you put something behind, behind it, it or, or just leave it open? It open. No, it's no, going to be open. Uh, uh, somebody's somebody. behind it. Uh, it's going to be open, open because you don't see the back of it. Uh, there's going to be a picture frame right here. There's going to be a little jackalope that's over the door. Oh, okay. Um, this gets this gets uh, wallpaper that's going to be peeling up and stuff like that. So it, it's going to be more of an interactive piece. You're going to see you're going to see both sides of it. You're going to be able to look through the front and the back. Okay, so you'll get as much as you see in the front as the back. I'll have a different story, things like that. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So this is what it goes on an old an old piece of. of uh, uh, I'm a fence post that that's so pretty cool. We'll sit on that like that, uh, and that's going to be the display piece. Are you planning fun. on permanently attaching the model, or is it going to be on a separate base like you showed earlier? No, no, it'll be permanently attached. This is a display figure. It's not a. It's it's not going to be a gaming figure. Um, so on, on that display figure, it should be attached. I want to be able to see the knot holes and stuff. Well, but I want to be able to see these knot holes and stuff. Uh, so she'll have like one foot right here and one foot right there as she's coming out of the doors. Can you hold up the doors that you made to the piece so we can see kind of the composition of that? Um, oh, cool. It'll be roughly. It'll be roughly something like this. Oh, right on. Like this. Adds doors, even more movement. Yeah, the doors will be banging open uh, as she's coming out. You know, you'll really see that she kind of forced her way through the doors. And then there's a little saloon sign that'll go over the top. That's why I, I didn't do a lot of weathering on the top. You guys noticed um, there's a there's a sign that will say saloon on it up above the top. Of that. Right so, um, yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you, Caleb. That was great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Awesome, Caleb. All right, well, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, I don't know. Oh, we'll be at Gen Con next week, so we won't, we won't have a show next week. Yeah, we won't. Um, we won't but the, follow, the following week, uh, I'll probably be working on speed painting. Uh, I'm going to go over the techniques that went into doing the light and color on this guy. Um, so we're going to we're going to kind of paint another model like this. So that'll be the, the week after next week. Uh, we'll do that. So if you want to give you guys a little preview of what's next? Sure. Very cool. I get to see what I miss. <laughs> I'll record it for you. Awesome. Oh, you're gonna be in the class. You're gonna you're gonna get to see all this stuff firsthand. Yeah, Sweet. you'll be you'll be hands on. Your your the dreadnought should be this level right here. When we get done with the dreadnoughts, they should be. Oh. <laughs> now, are we doing all the same color, or are you you no. going through? Each, no. Whatever we want to do. You guys get to pick your own colors. Yeah, and you're bringing your own paint, so you guys can pick out your own colors. Hmm. Now I have a th something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
do it that way. Um, one, if you guys have certain armies, I know there's a lot of uh, 40k players that are coming to the class. So if if you have certain armies that you're playing, I figure you might want to paint the, the Dreadnought to the army you're going to play. I'm going to be doing a, an Imperial Fist one because that's the army I'm painting. Um, mm-hmm. the, the next few figures, you're going to see a lot of yellow. <laughs> so I'm doing, I'm doing quite a few uh, Imperial Fist uh, models. But I figured everybody will be able to choose their colors to match up their armies. What color do you find the most difficult to paint? The most difficult to paint? Um, not, none anymore. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird. Um, w- once you figure out light and, and, and you get away from just painting with pot, going from color to color and trying to use just regular recipes, um, gosh, there's no color that's really a difficult color to paint. It, it's just a matter of making sure that you're you're using the right tones and the right temperature of colors to create contrast. I mean, um, you know, these are two these are two very complicated colors to do: is reds and and blues to black. Um, but it was just really a matter of making sure that I I had the right transition colors to to make everything uniform. This model. Was completely done in like what would you say, Cat? Three hours? About three hours. But the buildup yeah. of that and the undertone colors that you did was amazing. Yeah, I mean that's a different class, but um, you know, it, it's mainly just knowing your colors and knowing light. You know, greens, um, same thing. It's just quick colors. Um, mm-hmm. No color is really difficult. When you're beginning, everybody says yellow is very difficult. Um, because everybody tries to take and paint yellow, and when when you want a model that's going to be yellow, you primer it and then you try to paint it yellow, you know. And that that's where the struggle is: is trying to paint this over a primer is is so difficult. It's so hard to do. But if you know your transition colors, you know, and and you actually start your yellow with with a color like this or with a nice umber, and then bring it up to this, and then once you know your shadow, use your shadow color, you know, something like this, your yellow becomes super easy to do. It's just a matter of, of just kind of understanding how light works and what colors you're going to use. I'm sorry that's such a vague answer. I don't have a... That was a, a great really, question. A really great <clears throat> Paint, <laughs> paint more, and, and no color will be an issue for you. I love, I love painting black. You'll notice a lot of my models mm-hmm. get black. I found some great transition colors for black, and a lot of really nice shadow, uh, uh, like nuance colors that go into shadows that just make black so vibrant that I love using it on models now because of that. Well, I think you just determined what I'm getting when I'm painting my dread dot. Yay. Black, huh? Yeah, well, I do. I used to do 30K Dark Angels. And oh, yes. By the fluff standard, there should be black. So. Mm-hmm. All right, well, get, um, message me mm-hmm. uh, when you're getting ready to collect up all your paints, and I will give you a recipe of paints to round up. Okay, can you and name a line? I probably have it. Right on. Yeah, just just message me and I'll, I'll be able to write them all down for you. Cool. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. That'll be fun to see. Oh, we're still alive. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> all right. Anyways, if you guys are wondering what we're talking about, um, I have a, a class in DC. Uh, it's an airbrushing class. It's one of the weekenders. It's it's roughly anywhere from. 16 to 18 hours, we'll, we'll completely paint a Contemptor Dreadnought, um, and it'll be to that, that commission standard. It'll be roughly to this standard, um, the entire Dreadnought. Fun class. Um, it's all about airbrushing with a little bit of brushwork. Uh, if you're interested, uh, just contact CK Studios. And, uh, we can get one set up in your area. Yeah. So, uh, any last closing questions, or we'll go ahead and close this out. 
that was good. All right. Thank well, well, Kat, thank you for having me on Hobby Hangout again. I, I love doing these. Thanks so much for sharing, Caleb, and we'll catch you in two weeks. All right. Thank you.